Hey Matthew the Gathering players, are you sick of your standard format being ruined by all too powerful card combos? Come to Yu-Gi-Oh! Well, nothing's ever happened like that before. Hey y'all, it's Jake Pig, and this video is a little bit different. I'm going to try something a little bit new, a little bit more of a teaching kind of video. And this in particular is going to be for Magic the Gathering players who are trying to get into Yu-Gi-Oh! and kind of teach them the ins and outs of the game. Now this video is going to be rather involved, so there'll be timestamps for different sections from the absolute basics to the kind of decks you'll be playing based on the Magic decks you like. Now then, let's jumpstart this thing. You get it? It was a Magic mechanic. First, let's talk about the layout of a field. A Yu-Gi-Oh board is set, unlike Magic the Gathering where it doesn't really matter where cards are located. As such, if you're playing paper instead of a simulator, you'll need a field center so you know where the middle of the board is. On each side, there are 5 monster zones and 5 spell and trap card zones underneath that. Each end of the spell and trap card zone is where pendulum scales can be placed, something we'll get into later. Each side of the field also has their own field spell zone where a field spell can be placed, which again we'll get into later, you're gonna be hearing that a lot during this fucking part of the video. You also want your deck, above your deck is your graveyard, and above that is your banished pile. There's also a place for the extra deck which goes opposite your main deck and we'll get into the extra deck monsters later and how all that stuff works. And lastly there was an extra monster zone which only one player can use at a time in most situations which any card from the extra deck can go into. Some cards from the extra deck can only go in these zones but we'll explain that more later. Zones in Yu-Gi-Oh are important due to stuff like link monsters and a few specific decks which again we'll dive into later. I sound like a fucking broken record saying that but it's the truth. So it's important to know how the board looks. There are three different kind of cards, each with their own subtypes. The main three card types are monster cards, spell cards, and trap cards. These all have magical equivalents, or at least most of them do, so as they come up I'll explain what the magic version of these cards are. Monsters are the most complicated, so we'll save those for last. For now, let's start with trap cards. There are three types of trap cards. The basic form is a normal trap. A trap card must be set on the field before it can be used. Setting a card is putting a card face down, which is something all cards can do. Once a trap card is set, it can't be used until after your turn ends, but it can be as soon as the opponent's turn begins. Some cards ignore this restriction, but those are very rare. After this goes by, trap cards pretty much act like an instant. The next set of trap cards are continuous traps, represented by this little infinity looking symbol. These are trap cards that once activated stay on the field face up. These generally have lingering effects and are most like enchantments in magic. Lastly, there are counter traps. Counter traps can only be responded to with other counter traps. We'll get to Yu-Gi-Oh's equivalent to stacking later, but there's things called spell speech which determine when a card can be activated. Once we get to that, we'll cover counter traps a little more in detail, but basically a counter trap relies on the opponent to do something, and once you activate a counter trap, only a counter trap can respond to another counter trap. And those are the main trap cards. So now let's get to spell cards. Firstly, there are normal spells. These are pretty much Yu-Gi-Oh's version of sorceries. They can only be activated on your turn and it has to be the first card in a chain, which again is Yu-Gi-Oh's version of the stack, but we'll get to that later. Just like sorceries, they can't be activated in the middle of a chain or a stack, whatever you want to refer to it as for now. There are also field spells, which are again, the closest comparison is an enchantment. A player can only control one, but there can be two on the field at the same time, with one in each player's field. You can play a new field spell card if you have one in your field spell zone already, but the one already on the field will be sent to the graveyard in the exchange for this. Next are quick play spells, which are the closest thing Yu-Gi-Oh has to instance. It can be played from your hand at any point during your turn, including in a chain, minus spell speed 3, and can also be used during your opponent's turn. To play it on your opponent's turn, however, it has to be set on the field first. And like trap cards, you cannot activate this until your turn ends and your opponent's turn begins. Quick play spells are the only type of spell cards that you can't activate the turn of this set, but however, every other type of spell card can be set and activated on the same turn. Next are equip spells. These attach themselves to a monster because they're basically or enchantments or equipment. If a monster ever gets set, the equipped card is automatically destroyed. These are also sent to the graveyard once the monster leaves the field in any ways. An equipped spell does go in the spell and trap card zone just like any other spell and trap card, they don't ever go onto the monster itself. The last kind of spell card are continuous spells, which are pretty much again just like enchantments. They're pretty much identical to continuous traps in about every way, but can be activated at the same turn that they're put on the field and go into effect right away, unlike the trap card equivalent. And lastly, we've come to monsters. There are only three available monsters in the main deck. Normal monsters, which are monsters with no effects that will basically never be used outside of very niche decks and combos. There are also effect monsters, which are exactly what they sound like, and pendulum monsters. 
A pendulum monster can be used as either a monster or a spell card. If used as a spell, they'll go in the scale zone. But we'll touch on pendulums a little bit later since they're a bit more complicated. In Yu-Gi-Oh! you have a 40 to 60 card main deck and also a 15 card deck called the Extra Deck. The Extra Deck are cards that you always have access to, but there's only specific cards that can go in the Extra Deck. There isn't really a magic equivalent to this. The closest comparison is Companions, however there's not like this weird criteria you have to meet like with Companions. Let's get right into the types of monsters in the Extra Deck. First, there are fusion monsters, which is the fusing of two or more monsters to make it. This is either done with a fusion spell, or by forming what's called a contact fusion, which is a fusion using monsters on the field without the use of any spell code. Fusion monsters that can be made with contact fusing say so on the fusion monster itself, otherwise you have to use the fusing spell using the materials listed that are needed to make said monster. The monsters used for the fusion generally go straight to the graveyard, however some cards make them go into the deck, the banner zone, it's, it's kind of the pens, but for the most part, just assume fusion materials go into the graveyard. The fusion materials for each card is listed under the artwork and seen here. All fusion monsters are purple so you easily know what they are. Next are synchro monsters, which require a tuna and a non-tuna monster to make. A tuna monster is listed as such, and to make a synchro, both monsters must be on the field. The level of the tuna monster and the other monster must add up to equal the level of the synchro monster. Some monsters require a specific amount of tuners and non-tuners, and others require specific monsters to be used. The monsters used for a synchro summon, like fusion summoning, are sent straight to the graveyard. XE monsters are next, and require you to have monsters of the same level. The amount needed is listed on the card, and an XZ summon occurs by putting the monsters on top of each other, and the XZ monsters on top of them. While cards are attached to an XZ monster, they're considered materials. They're no longer considered the monsters they were, rather just materials, so all the effects on the original cards are void. Most XZ monsters have an effect they can use by detaching a material, or effects depending on how many materials are attached to it. Unlike synchros and fusions, these have a rank rather than a level. Because of this, cards that affect monsters with certain levels cannot be used against an XZ monster. And lastly are Link monsters. These send the material needed to the graveyard from the field in order to make them. Any monster is always considered a Link 1, and to make a Link summon, the card set must equal the Link rating of the monster being summoned. Link monsters can be treated either as a Link 1 or the Link rating that they are. Some monsters require 2 plus materials, meaning that for a Link 3 with this requirement, a Link 2 monster and a Link 1 monster can be used to make it. Although you can use 3 different monsters for a Link 3 with this material requirement. The link requirement must equal to the link number and cannot exceed it. This means a link 3 and a link 1 monster could not be used to make another link 3 monster. Link monsters can only be placed in the extra monster zone, or to a zone a link monster points to with its arrows. This restriction does not apply if they're being special summoned from the graveyard. And lastly, we're back to pendulum monsters. Pendulum monsters have numbered scales, and when two pendulum monsters are on the scales, any number of monsters of levels between the two scale numbers can be special summoned in what's called a pendulum summon. While on the scales, pendulums are treated as spell codes and use the effect in the upper text box. While on the field in the monster zone, they are monsters with their monster effects, if any. If a pendulum monster would be sent from the field to the graveyard, they'll go face up in the extra deck instead. They only go to the graveyard if they're sent there from the hand of deck, or if the summoner activation of it is negated. Pendulum monsters that are face up in the extra deck can be pendulum summoned, however, if they're coming from the extra deck, they have to go in either the extra monster zone, or to a zone a link monster points to. A pendulum summon can only be attempted once per turn. One thing to note about all the extra deck monsters is they must be summoned properly before being able to be summoned another way. For example, a link monster that got sent to the graveyard directly from the extra deck cannot be special summoned from the graveyard with a card like Monster Reborn. However, if it was properly link summoned and then sent to the graveyard later, either by link summoning it away, combat, whatever, then you can Monster Reborn in order to revive it. This is also true for any card that reads must first be special summoned. And that covers all the monster lineups. There seems like there's a lot, but for the most part you'll get to hang out pretty quickly since most decks only use one to two of these kind of mechanics, and pendulums aren't really played too often anymore. The layout of a card for trap and spell cards aren't too important, and simply distinguish the type of card they are, of which we already covered in the last segment. Monster cards are more involved. Instead of having a color identity, Yu-Gi-Oh has what's called attributes. Unlike Magic, since there's no mana system in Yu-Gi-Oh, these are generally a lot less important, although do come up in certain decks. Also unlike Magic, a card can only have one attribute, meaning there's no multicolor identities or anything like that. Monster types are just like creature types. After the type listed, there's also a listing on the kind of monster it is, be it a tuner monster, an effect monster, etc. 
Monsters have an attack and defense, which are Yu-Gi-Oh's versions of power and toughness respectively. The stars above the art is the monster's level, so 4 stars means it's level 4, 2 stars are level 2, etc. The phases of a game of Yu-Gi-Oh are pretty much identical to a game of Magic. Both players start with 5 cards in their hand however instead of 7, and the first turn player like Magic does not draw. One major difference in Yu-Gi-Oh is that it does not have any kind of mulligan system, so whatever cards are in your starting hand you are stuck with. As such, combos that require more than 1 or 2 cards aren't too common in Yu-Gi-Oh, as without mulligans you want as consistent as a deck as possible. The upkeep is called the draw phase and like Magic, the first turn player does not draw a card while the second player does. After that comes the standby phase, which is essentially a phase to activate cards before the main phase starts. The main phase is just like magic and in the combat phase is called the battle phase which we'll get to in a second, and then after the battle phase you have your main phase 2, like magic's main phase 2. The battle phase is entirely optional and if you don't use it you go straight to the end phase after main phase 1. Like magic, the first turn player cannot conduct the battle phase. The end phase happens before the turn officially ends, just like magic. In the draw phase, the draw comes first no matter what, so you cannot activate any kind of card until after the card is drawn, in which case you can start activating stuff after the fact. Combat in Yu-Gi-Oh is much different though. Unlike Magic, you do not get to choose blocks or anything like that. The attacking player chooses what monsters they attack, and they cannot attack the opponent's life points unless there are no monsters on the field, unless the card says otherwise. In order for a monster to destroy another by battle, their attack must be greater than the opposing monster's attack or defense, depending on the position. If the two monsters have the same attack, both monsters are destroyed as a result of the battle. If the attack and defense are equal, then nothing occurs. If the opposing monster has higher defense, you take damage to your life points equals to the difference. If the attacking monster has a higher attack than the opposing one, then the opponent takes life point damage equal to the difference and the attacking monster is destroyed. A defense position monster, no matter the difference between attack and defense, will never cause you to take life point damage outside of Yu-Gi-Oh's version of Trample, which is called Piercing Damage. There are multiple steps to the battle phase. When a monster declares an attack, this is a step of battle. Afterwards, it transitions into the damage step, which only cards that alter attack and defense can be activated, or cards that negate until that battle concludes. You can catch players off guard with this, though the situation doesn't come up too often. You don't have to worry too hard about it, but it's good information to know for the future. Now that you know about phases, let's get more in depth with what you can do to them with the mechanics of Yu-Gi-Oh. Let's start with chains. A chain is Yu-Gi-Oh's version of stacking, however they work a bit differently. Unlike Magic, you can only respawn to the last card played in a chain. That means if someone plays a card as Chain Link 1, you have the chance to respawn to it as Chain Link 2. However, if you don't, the player can activate another card in the chain, and you can now only respawn to Chain Link 2, and can no longer respawn to Chain Link 1 in any way. Once the chain is resolved, it resolves from the last card played all the way up to the first. If two cards activate at the same time, then you may choose the order of the chain links. This is important, as you can keep effects that you want to resolve safe by making them the chain link 1 and the less important effect chain link 2. This is a technique known as chain blocking. Here's an example of it in action. Let's say you link someone a card like Salaman Great Bailing, which adds a card from your deck to your hand. If this is the only card in your chain, your opponent can stop this by using Ass Blossom and Joyous Spring. However, if you link summon Salaman Great Bailing, where you have a card like Salaman Great Gazelle in your hand, which is a card that special summons itself when a Salaman Great Monster is sent to the graveyard, which it will since you just link summoned with it, both effects activate at the same time. As such, you can choose the order you want them to occur in in the chain. By doing so, you can make Bay Links Chain Link 1 and Gazelle Chain Link 2. This prevents the opponent from using Ass Blossom and Joyous Springs on Bay Links like in the other scenario, as the opponent can now only respawn to Gazelle since it's the last card in that chain. All spell cards except Quick Play spells are considered to be Spell Speed 1, which can only be activated as a Chain Link 1, just like Sorceries in Magic. Trap cards and Quick Play spells are all Spell Speed 2, which can be chained to other cards or activated as Chain Link 1 on their own, just like Magic's Instance. Counter Traps are the only cards to be considered Spell Speed 3. These are cards that can only be responded to by other Spell Speed 3 cards, in other words, they can only be responded to with other Counter Traps. Counter Traps can respond to cards of lower speed spells, however. Spell Speed 4 is the rarest, and these refer to cards that cannot be responded to at all. Now we move on to the meat of the duel, the main phase. During the main phase, you can play cards that are Spell Speed 1, 2, and Summon Monsters. Spell Speed 1 cards can only be played during your main phase 1 and 2, and no other phase. You may notice that Yu-Gi-Oh does not have any kind of mana system. This means that if you have a card in your hand that you can play, you can play it. This is why Yu-Gi-Oh players care a lot more about card advantage and drawing cards in the game. That's why something simple like Divination is perfectly fine in Magic, but Yu-Gi-Oh's version of it, Part of Greed, is banned and will never be unbanned. 
Even a card that lets you draw just one card is limited for being so good in Yu-Gi-Oh. That's just how important card advantage is in the game because of the lack of a mana system. When it comes to summoning monsters, you can normal summon a set once per turn and special summon as many times as you want. A monster can be normal summoned without cost so long as it's level 4 or lower. If a monster is level 5 or 6, then it requires a tribute to normal summon. A tribute is exactly like a magic sacrifice. When a monster gets tributed, it gets sent to the graveyard and for a tribute summon allows it to be replaced by the monster you just tributed for. Level 7 and higher monsters require 2 tributes instead of just 1. If a monster requires more than 2 or a specific kind of card to be tributed, it will say so in the text. Monsters are summoned in attack position, but they can also be set in face down defense position. You cannot place a card from your hand in face up defense position despite what anime may tell you. For a set card, the opponent won't know what the card is, however, its level requirements still must be met if it's a tribute summon monster. If a card is set, just like trap and quick play spells, they cannot be flipped up by you until your turn comes around. The card is flipped up to face up defense position if an opponent's monster attacks it. If you decide to flip it up on your turn, it has to be flipped up into face up attack position, and this is called a flip summon. You can flip summon monsters as many times as you want. However, a monster's position can only be changed once per turn. After a monster is flipped face up, you cannot place it face down again outside of a card that specifically does that. In Yu-Gi-Oh, monsters do not have a summoning sickness. This means they can attack the same turn they are played. However, the first turn player cannot attack. Unlike Magic, players do not hold priority after the summon. Let me explain. In Magic, if you cast, let's say, Krenko Mob Boss, the opponent has to react to the summon itself, but once it hits the board, you can activate its effect before the opponent can respond to it. However, in Yu-Gi-Oh, if a monster has an effect that can activate on the field, the opponent can activate a card before you use its effect. Doing this, you would generally say you activate it on summon. The only exception to this rule is if the effect activates when the monster itself is summoned. All monsters can be special summoned. However, some cards require it to be special summoned in a specific way. If a card says must be special summoned by blank and not must first, then that means that is the only way it can be special summoned. All extra deck monsters are considered to be special summons. Let's go back to the extra deck and how they play with face down monsters. A monster that is face down can be used as a fusion material, as it simply flipped face up to show it's the proper material before being used. A face down monster cannot be used for a synchro, XZ, or link summon, however. Some cards in Yu-Gi-Oh create tokens, which are exactly like magic tokens. Tokens can be used for any kind of extra deck summon except for XZ monsters. They can also be treated as a monster for a tribute summon. Both players start with 8,000 life points and the game ends when either player has zero or they have no cards left in their deck. There's also some alternative win cons like Exodia as you probably know, but these rarely ever actually come up. Another mechanic to know are once per turn effects. If a card does not say once per turn on it, then it can be used as many times as you'd like. All monster effects are usually considered spell speed 1 unless there's text that reads quick effect or if it says during either player's turn, in which case it's considered a spell speed 2 effect. If a card reads you can only use the effect of the monster's name once per turn, then no matter what happens, that is the only time it can be used even if it gets negated. However, if the card reads you can only activate this effect once per turn, then if the activation is negated, you can use it again. This is also true for spell and trap cards. If a card simply reads once per turn, then that means only that copy of that card can use that effect once per turn. If another copy of it winds up on the field, you can use that effect again as long as it isn't the same original card. If a card ever leaves the field and returns, that is always considered a new copy. So, let's say you have Cyber Dragon Infinity. Hey, that's the mascot. It has an effect that reads, once per turn, you can target one face-up attack position monster on the field, attach it to this card as material. This means if you have two different copies of it on the field, each one can use that effect. Er, uh, let's say you link it away after using its effect and revive it with Monster Reborn. Even if you use its effect that turn, since it's considered a new copy of Cyber Dragon Infinity, you can use its effect to attach an attack position monster and the field again. When a card targets another card for an effect, the opponent has the chance to activate the card or add another card in response. However, if a card does not target, then the decision to use a card must be made before the cards to be affected are chosen. Let's look at an example with Cybernetic Overflow. This card's effect is all one sentence without a semicolon, meaning it doesn't do anything as cost, which we'll get to later. It also doesn't mention targeting at all. This means the opponent must respond to the activation of Cybernetic Overflow before its effect begins. If they choose not to, then you can resolve it fully and the opponent cannot activate anything until it resolves. If a card targets, for the most part, unless it's a really old card, it will say that it targets. And now let's get to cost. Some cards require a cost to be used and must always be paid no matter what. 
You must pay the cost before the effect can be activated, so the cost is paid before a card can even attempt to negate it. To see if a card requires a cost before the effect, it is best seen with a semicolon. For an example, let's look at the spell card Twin Twisters, which requires you to discard a card and target two cards on the field before the effect can activate. Before any other card can be added to the chain, both these costs have to be made. No card in the game can negate cost. For example, Ghost Spell in a Haunted Mansion has an effect that can negate the effect of a card that banishes itself from the graveyard. It cannot negate a card like Destiny Hero Melissus, which banishes itself from the graveyard as a cost to special summon another copy of itself from the deck. Since the banish is a cost, it's not an effect, and is also why Ghost Spell is unable to be activated in this instance, since it's not a part of the effect, it's a part of the cost. A card being sent somewhere has cost does not count as it being sent has a card effect. So, a card like Sadal Dragon that has an effect for being sent to the graveyard by card effect will not trigger if it's sent there via a cost. Even if a card is negated, you can still pay the cost without activating it. So, let's say Skill Drain is on the field, a trap card that negates all monster effects while you have a copy of it. You have a copy of Snipe Hunter on the field. As a cost, Snipe Hunter discards a card to activate its effect. Even though Skill Drain is on the field, you can still attempt to activate it and pay the cost, so you can discard a card to attempt to activate it even if the effect itself won't resolve. And we've reached the end stretch. The last thing I want to talk about is the kind of decks you'd want to play depending on the kind of decks you like playing. Unlike Magic, colors aren't really a part of a playstyle. You see blue in Magic, you expect to see control. You see red, you usually see aggro. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! there really isn't anything similar. As such, it can make it harder to find the deck for you. The biggest thing with Yu-Gi-Oh! and other card games really, is that rather than being focused on a broad type of card, we have what are called archetypes. An archetype is kinda like tribal, though more in a condensed sense. An archetype is usually found by the naming convention that each member of that archetype has. For example, Cyber Dragon is an archetype. As such, Cyber Dragon can usually be found in cards with the text in its name. Some archetypes have their own powerful boss monsters, while others use their engines to make powerful monsters to get onto the field. There's not really generic decks out there like Mono Red or Blue White Control. Decks in Yu-Gi-Oh are more like Goblins in Historic or Demirugs in Standard. In some cases, two archetypes are mixed together with good synergy they have with each other. So, what are some archetypes you might like playing based on your magic taste? Well, there's a lot of them. Yu-Gi-Oh again has hundreds of archetypes, but in general there are four types of decks, two of which are split into different categories, combo and control. There's a part of the video that gets dated because it's relevant now, but in the future these decks might not even be a thing anymore. There are two kinds of control variants. One of them is one built to out-resource your opponent. These decks generally have a lot of recursion in order to keep pressure on the opponent. These aren't too unlike mid-range decks and magics, with Yu-Gi-Oh examples including Salaman Great and Orcus. I won't go into details and give deck lists, as it's better for you to google them and learn from dedicated players of these decks. The other side of control is back row decks. These use a ton of spell and trap cards to constantly negate your opponent's cards while slowly whittling down your opponent's life points. Popular back row decks include Altergeist and Paleo Frogs. On the other side of the spectrum there is combo. On one side, there's control combo. These do long combos which set up multiple boss monsters, generally with powerful negates on the board on their first turn to prevent the opponent from doing anything on their turn. Examples of this include Pendulums and Dragon Link. On the other side, there's OTK or One Turn Kill decks. These are decks that generally want to go a second, break the opponent's board, and then set up enough monsters to kill that opponent on that turn. An example of this is Cyber Dragons, baby! There are so many different kinds of decks in Yu-Gi-Oh, be it meta, rogue, or casual. Since Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't have any kind of rotation like Magic, a card released in the very first set is still playable in the modern game. Yu-Gi-Oh does have a ban list to keep the meta healthy and fun, and sometimes new cards drastically increase the power of old ones. So what's relevant now might not even be on anyone's radar in less than a year. I'm also happy to help you find the kind of decks you want to build. If you have a kind of playstyle you'd want to go with, I can help steer you in the right direction of the deck you'd most likely enjoy. I'll be rather active in the comments section, so feel free to ask. And with that, we've reached the end of the video. We didn't touch on super advanced rulings, but what we did touch on is just about everything that's important to get started. If you need any help, I'm always happy to apply the knowledge I have, as I've been playing this game for a few years now. Yu-Gi-Oh! is an incredibly fun game and one of the most expressive ones out there. I always recommend people to have two major card games they play so they can turn to one if one of the metas ever goes sour for a bit, which is also why I personally started playing Magic. Besides, both games are a ton of fun and very different and definitely worth your time. Plus, Yu-Gi-Oh! has a ton of free simulators out there so you can try without ever having to touch your wallet. I've been JakePeg, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you dueling some Yu-Gi-Oh! soon. Like comment and subscribe for more Yu-Gi-Oh content and also zombies content if you're into that.